So I guess I was first on the list, so I have to start. Uh, and I uh, appropriately named a, my presentation How Not to Grow Oil Seeds because of our history on the farm. We, uh, we put a lot of effort into it and had some successes in it, uh, but more failures than success. Um, so start off, I'm Alan Druffel. We farm in uh, uh, northwest uh, Nez Perce County, southeast Whitman County. Uh, Colton Uniontown area and down by Lewiston, Idaho. Uh, we're a very diverse farm. It's 50 miles from one end to the other, starting up by Pullman and going all the way south through Lewiston down towards Waha, Idaho. Uh, 8 to 20 inches of rain annually, depending on where you were at. Uh, a lot of different soil types, uh, a lot of different rotations, wheat fallow to three year winter wheat, spring wheat, spring barley, and a spring pulse. Uh, we've been direct seed for 10 plus years. There's stuff on our farm that's been in almost as long as 20 years. It's continuous direct seed. Um, we like to say we farm with an emphasis on soil health, and that's one of the big draws to oil seeds for us is the diversity. Uh, oh, let's start with the equipment. Uh, with the challenges, we primarily run seed hawk drills. Uh, they are a shank drill with independent depth control, but the ones we have are, are a heavy drill and it's all on board and so they tend to slough off the hill a little bit. And in spring canola, we have a, a real struggle to maintain seed depth on the side hills. Uh, and we have a John Deere 1860 that we use, that's a neighbor's. Uh, it does not have an ability to deep band fertilizer with it. So we stream jetted uh, 32 on top uh, this last year. And, and we had some mismanaged residue. Uh, that was just, we kind of shotgunned our spring canola. We were not prepared to uh, put it in with that drill. We wanted to use the shank drill and the conditions just weren't gonna allow it. So we went in with the disc and had too much residue laying on the ground and kind of left some seeds tucked above the straw and on the ground. Um, uh, we always ask where does it fit in the rotation. Uh, we've used it in different legs. Uh, one of our struggles is in spring canola, extending our rotations out to a four or a five year rotation. We typically have our farm broken out into thirds. And when you choose to do one field into that four or five year, then you get double ups on your fall wheat and it's hard to cash flow the farm at that point. And, and so, uh, and, and then also coming back after the beyonds, if you're using uh, clear field wheats, where do you put it in? And, and we've been raising clear field canola for that reasons. And our, our, with the Roundup Ready fall canola that we've been growing, there's a lot of debates on GMOs and do we want them on the farm? Uh, as a farmer, I, I love the technology, but there are some issues with the consumer and ultimately they have to make the decision if they want our product. So I always, always think if we had a non-GMO Roundup Ready Clearfield canola, that'd be perfect. But so, uh, I guess the types of fertilizer we use uh, on spring canola, we fertilize it a lot like you would spring barley, you know, about the same end. We do add some extra boron in there. We seem to get a good response uh, from boron and, and we aren't putting anything with the seed. That's all deep banded if we can, or uh, we'll just put it on top. Uh, we'd prefer to deep band it with the shank drill. Uh, the fall canola and rape, we, we aren't putting any fertilizer with it at all at the time of seeding. Uh, we'll come back about September and uh, stream jet on about 75% of the fertilizer and then try and come back and put about 25% on in the spring. And uh, in some of our grounds, we have uh, pHs that are getting into the high fours and low fives, which is scary, uh, not only for canola, for all of our crops. And, and we've been on, a, on our own ground because we feel like this is a long-term investment trying to do a three-year rotation on lime, uh, trying to get those pHs corrected. So, I was saying it, it's a gold rush plus, as I watched that show, Gold Rush, and those guys put a hell of a lot of effort into it but never make any money. 
That's kind of what I feel like we're we're doing a little bit. Um, uh, it's there, there's a lot of variables in canola that we aren't sure about yet, at least on our farm. Uh, I like to say we we're more experienced at this. I was asked to do this talk, and I, I'm not an experienced brassica grower at all. So, but there is an upside. Uh, if you can find a contract for the canola, uh, then it gives you a, a little bit of stability. Uh, you can at least know what your end price is. And I went and custom cut some neighbors spring canola that went really well. And I saw he made a profit and I, I, I know somebody can do it. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. The big advantage is to me is soil health. Uh, to get this into the rotation is huge. Uh, I, I think a canola plant's as good as a plow uh, and, and it's gonna help break up that compaction layer um, and bring some of the nutrients up to the, up to the top and uh, help with nutrient cycling. We, we still don't have a lot of diversity. Canola helps, but we're all cool season crops and uh, the more diversity we can get in there, I, I think it, it's gonna help long-term with soil health. Um, uh, as far as harvest goes, I, I, I remember when we started cutting fall canola with the old combines and, and just to get that into the header was a nightmare. I remember trying everything from taking the reel chain off to just let it drag in, which that was a disaster, to I, just everything to get it feed into the combines. And now with the newer equipment, we use draper headers with the top auger and it seems to do a really good job getting anything fed into it and through. Uh, we have had a, a lot of tires pop from spring canola. It just seems to be sharp. Um, and timing of them, winter varieties seem to harvest before the fall grain in the same area, so that's easy to do. And then the spring varieties are after. So it, uh, it, it does work as far as harvest timing for us. Uh, that's about all I had. There's just a couple pictures of us harvesting canola. Uh, so if you have any questions, that's that's about it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Harvest time, do you push it over? Do you spray it? Do you we, it? What do you do with it? We, have, we flew around up on it. Uh, this is the, the, on the spring canola. So we'll just spray it up. I'm Don Port. I farm in Laytuck County. In Wallowa County, Oregon. I've been farming for 40 years, as long as I've been this far. Anyway, it's been a long pro process of canola. <clears throat> we started out with rape, fall rape, when I was a kid. We transferred from that into mustards, some spring, spring rape, spring varieties of rape. It's been a, a good good mix for us because we farm in Troy Idaho and it's not the best ground in the world because it's a high clay content cut over timber ground. Oregon isn't quite so bad because there's some silt loams down there. Probably our biggest aspect of fall canola in Troy Idaho is that it, it'll pond, it'll be wet for two or three weeks in the spring and it'll die out. And that's probably our biggest problem with fall canola seeding there. Our seeding rates when we first started was probably 10, 12 pounds. Now we're down to that three pounds, basically because seed cost is astronomical. Um, we've tried different varieties of drills. We went. First of all, we started probably with hay busters. We went to Kraus and ripper shooted their fertilizer in. Uh, we used to use a, a lot of Valmar, where we Valmar'd it in so we get that shallow depth to get it in. We cultivated it, we've harrowed it, we've rolled it. Try to get a decent stand out there. So our last drill that we bought is a 1870 John Deere drill. Conserva pack which I think for the money is well worth it. Um, we've tried different starter packages. We put ZNP on with the seed. 
um, different phosphates. Um, also put boron on. Usually on the fall canola, we'll put uh, 100 pounds of N, some phosphate, 20 pounds, and 20 pounds of sulfur. This last year was very interesting. We had about 700 acres of spring canola. It averaged about 1,800 pounds to 1,900 pounds, and that was all in Oregon. We had one of those where all the stars lined up. <clears throat> then that year we had a lot of flea beetle, and flea beetles a real been a real big issue to me because when you have small little plants, and if that seed doesn't take off and doesn't grow at the very first your success rate is very low. We've had, had it, you know, they come back and say, you want 20% infestation of bugs before you spray. I disagree very muchly. If you can see them out there biting on that crop, you better go spray. Because one spot will be thick as sleeves. You go 20 feet and there won't be a thing. But within three or four days, that flea leaf beetle can cover that whole field, it'll knock that seedling down to hardly nothing, and that, ha and that seedling has a hard time recovering from that setback. So that's, that was one of, probably one of our major problems has been seed, flea leaf beetle. Um, this summer, we had some three different seeding dates for fall canola. We've got about 750 acres of fall canola in. Uh, it rained a lot, most of this is in Oregon. It rained a lot in Oregon. Uh, the first seeding was on June 28th. The second seeding was CRP ground. We took out, we sprayed, we round up, and we took the conserva pack and we went directly right into that, that ground and seeded right into that where it ripped it up, you know, you had sod clumps, you know, that pulled up. So we only went about two to three miles an hour because the faster we went, the bigger the clumps came. So we went slow as heck to get through that. But <clears throat> we had a very excellent stand after that. Then on August 29th, we had about two or three inches of rain after we got done with wheat harvest, we turned around and put about another 300 and some acres in on that wheat ground. Uh, it got up about six inches, is about six inches around in diameter now. We hope it'll make it through. And probably the best result of growing all these brassicas over the years has been organic matter and what that what has done to the soil. Um, we, use, we raise a lot of DNS wheat. Uh, our protein content has been 13 to 14 percent last year. And one of the reasons I think, and we only put about 120, 130 pounds on, our yields are around 60, 65 bushels out there on that. And one of the reasons we think we got the protein is that organic matter. It was a slow release throughout the year of that canola breaking down over that season to help it. We've had some ground, we raised canola wheat for probably 10 years. Our organic matter is about five now. In Idaho, it's about three. And some of that ground, you can go out after that 10 years and it's just like a garden almost. It's just mellow, loose ground. Um, <coughs> When it comes to harvesting, over the years, a lot of elevators wanted seven, six, seven percent. And it's hard to get at that six, seven percent moisture. So we start in at 10 percent moisture. And we put it in a bin and we turn on the fans. And why we do that is because you get so much shatter if you wait till that 10 percent moisture content. And that, that can even be two weeks at high elevations and cool temperatures to, just to get it there. And then, at, then we probably run those fans probably for two to three weeks and then we'll 
we usually like to ship it out. Because canola is hard to store. It really is. Especially when you've got varieties that do not ripen up all the, si all the same time. You'll have some varieties that'll be green, some will ripen up fine. Then sometimes when it gets about harvest, it'll start raining on that, and some will even start blooming again when you're harvesting. And we've also swathed some, we've also paraquatted some, so it's been a, a long road of doing this stuff over the years. Okay, my name's Randy Etman. I'm a farmer south of Spokane. We farm in uh, southern Spokane County and then over into Idaho, into Kootenai County a little bit. Uh, I'm fourth generation on our farm. I farm with my dad and my brother and uh, my oldest boy right now. And we have one more boy that hopefully sometime he'll come back to the farm. Uh, my talk's gonna kind of just narrow in a little bit on our experiences from this last year. We raised three different uh, varieties of spring canola. We tried the Roundup Ready, Liberty Link, and then the Clearfield canola. And then uh, a little bit later, after we finished planting those, then we did plant a fall variety, uh, Amanda. And so we're waiting on the outcome on that one. So here's our three different varieties. And the boxes that are white, you know, are kind of the, the things that were common amongst the varieties. You can see that there's a, there's a fair difference in the, in the cost of the seed. And I think that you're paying for the technology on the Roundup Ready and the Liberty Link. Fertilizer's a constant. And then um, if you look in the left-hand column there, the two purple boxes, the Beyond, that's going to be a, a chemical that's specific to the Clearfield variety. One application of that for 1547 an acre. And then we, because of having lentils in our rotation, we have developed a, a significant problem with dog fennel. And we are now steering away from raising lentils. And so we put this clopyrrolid on to try to uh, take care of the dog fennel. If you go to the next column, the center column, then you'll see on the, the WeatherMax Roundup, that actually represents uh, two applications of Roundup. We uh, put an early application on, and the, the field that we were raising that on has a significant problem with wild oats and flush after flush of wild oats. And so we want to make sure, since we had Roundup available to us as a tool, we want to make sure that, that we took advantage of that and, and got rid of the, the later flush of uh, wild oats that would be coming. Then in the far right-hand column, you'll see Liberty at $14 an acre per application, and we added clethodem to it to get the grassy weeds. We did learn something there on that, that um, Liberty by itself is not very strong on grassy weeds and so there was about half or three quarters of the field that we came back and put a second application of Liberty and then added the clethodem to it. Uh, we chose to use spodnum, a pod sealant, on all of our acres. That cost us $15 an acre to have that flown on. Reclaim is a um, biological type of uh, additive that you can put in to help with uh, chemical residue carryover from our grain rotation. We felt like we were kind of taking a chance with buildup of stuff and, and um, like one of the earlier speakers mentioned, he said that they have a problem with pH and so we feel, and we have a low pH issue, we feel like our chemicals aren't breaking down as fast as what the label says. And so on the plant back restrictions, we have to add a little bit to that. So that was kind of our insurance, hopefully, to, to keep us from having a residue carryover. Calcium carbonate, we added 120 pounds to the acre of calcium carbonate in a granular form that went down just like a starter fertilizer would with the seed. The reason that we did that is the year before we had done some tests work with it. We spent $16 an acre and we got back $160 an acre more canola. And so we decided, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. We're going to go ahead and 
put that on every acre this year. So that's what we ended up doing. This here shows the seeding dates. The uh, Liberty Link, there was one field of Liberty Link that was our first field that we seeded, and then the second field of it was towards the tail end. So that's why you see two different columns there on that. The harvest dates, if you look at that, you'll see that there's a little bit of a correlation to the seeding date, but not, not real specific. We did find that the Liberty Link variety took quite a while to ripen. We experienced unevenness and kind of a green rubbery type of characteristic to some of the stuff in the draws and so forth. We're still kind of scratching our heads over that one. We do have uh, one field man that said that he feels that that was because we, we, we put the clopyr lid on it and that in his experience, the uh, Liberty, the Liberty Link, um, I'm saying this wrong, it would be the clear first, um, has less of a tolerance to that, um, the clopyr lid. This is where the, the big difference came in and that is also, this field man said that he feels that, that it's the, the addition of the clopyr lid on the clear first caused a, a reduction in yield. We know that it was, it was obviously very frustrating to try to harvest it in comparison to the other two varieties. The other varieties harvested very easily for us. Uh, this is an as a aerial of a particular field that got seeded to Roundup Ready canola. And, and this is in a previous year when it was in winter triticale. You can see a lot of bare areas out there. And well, we've raised spring wheat, winter wheat, spring triticale, winter triticale out there. And we have a lot of these bare areas. And we finally have kind of come to the conclusion that it must be wireworms that are causing that. This next photo will show what it looks like in canola. And we we're very happy with that. It was just a nice, solid stand. And um, we, we felt that we might have an answer there of, of something to plant where we have a, a high wireworm population. This is a field of winter canola that we seeded. It was seeded on the 6th of June. Uh, at the rate of four pounds the acre, it was seeded with a cross slot opener. We put on no fertilizer yet. We're, we're waiting until this spring to put on our fertilizer. We do have a herd of cattle, so we utilized the, all the growth that was out there to, to graze cattle on it several, several times. Um, this here is just a little bit closer photo. The stalks were probably an inch in diameter, three quarters of an inch in diameter. And the cattle just kept working away at it. One of the things that this field had was probably, it's a 65 acre field and there's probably 10 to 15 acres that's non-farmed and has a permanent grass cover on it. And so that kind of gave us the, the, the blend of, of a dry forage to feed, like Jack Brown was talking about. You know, you kind of wanted to have some hay there or something for them to, to utilize. Otherwise, the feed might be a little bit too rich if they were to eat that 100%. Uh, so if you look at this here, you'll see that we put different animals out there at different times. It was interesting to watch the animals to see how they, how they liked it. They would go to the grass areas and eat there first and then kind of pick through the, the canola and they didn't act like they liked it very well to start with. And so like the, the pairs that you see in there, the cows and calves, they got a couple chances to go out there and on their second chance to go back after they'd had a taste of it, they go straight to the canola. They, uh, they wouldn't eat the grass, you know, like they did the first time around. It's kind of like they had to develop a taste for it. And once, once they did, they, they preferred it. And I've been extremely conservative in, in my numbers here on the value of, of what we received off of grazing that. Uh, I think that number could probably be bumped up probably $35 an acre more than, than what I have there. This is a picture of the drill that we seeded with. 
It's been a, a retrofit, retrofit on a um, Flexicoil 6000 air drill, and we put cross slot openers on it. This is just a, a photo of the consistency of the stand seated into uh, winter wheat stubble. Photo of my dad with one of the plants. This is a CRP takeout field here. That would be the first crop since, since CRP. And I just have a few various pictures that I thought might generate a few questions. This is a Roundup Ready field here. That was the last field that we harvested there. That was the clear field variety, the one that was kind of rubbery and took a while to ripen up. Question? This is my understanding. The question was, is, is the canola that we're grazing still eligible for crop insurance? And we made a phone call before we put the cattle out there and inquired about that because we, we heard that through the grapevine that we should inquire and we, we were told that we were fine but you do want to make it known that that is what you're going to do before you turn the cows in. The wildlife love to go out there in crop and after the crop. This was the Roundup Ready field, and that's what it looked like in about October. And there are just hundreds and hundreds of deer out there, um, and this is just amazing. That was a field shortly after emergence. Um, this is the particular field that I told you about that we put two uh, applications around upon just because, as you can see in between the rows, it looks like a carpet, and that's, that's a flush of wild oats, and there'll be another one right after that, and another one right after that when it's in grain. You know, we just pull our hair out trying to keep the wild oats out of it. And this canola worked great because we came back in about six weeks later, gave it a second shot of Roundup, and by that time, the canola was ready to canopy, and, and it pretty well competed against everything else. And it was very, it was a lot of fun to harvest that field because it's been a problem one for years, and it was just nice and consistent from fence to fence. That was the end. Any other questions? On the wild oats, then when it can't be opened, did it pretty much eliminate the wild oats from coming back with another flush, or was there some in the field that? You know, there was, a, there was some more wild oats that attempted to grow again after the second application of Roundup, but they were so shaded by the canola being up and, and covering the ground so well at that point in time that they were just real spindly, just a few leaves on them, and by harvest time, they hadn't done enough to, I don't think they set any viable seed, actually. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, Karen had asked me, I believe, to participate in this. I'm not, we don't farm in this area, but it probably from our experience this spring back in North Dakota. Uh, <clears throat> I'm the assistant director for the U.S. Canola Association, but before I moved to Washington, D.C., I did farm for 25 years, and my son and Nephews are now operating that uh, joint family farm back in North Dakota. And uh, I'll back up, because this is a direct seeding conference, I'll back up a little bit back to 1984 uh, when I was farming, and we were still using 6200 press drills, uh, trying to leave as much trash uh, on top of our ground as possible. Some of our land was highly erodible. Uh, it, and our farm is located in north central North Dakota along the Canadian border, uh, 150 miles north of Bismarck. Uh, without a, a visual, I should have put something together, but without a visual, how I've told people is, is that if you were to take the, uh, continental, a map of the continental United States and put it up like a calendar with a thumbtack, that thumbtack at the top center of that uh, map would be where our farm is. We are, we are right in the center of the continent. And so uh, we're flat. Uh, we, we were, uh, you know, conventional tillage, but trying to leave as much trash on as possible. And in the spring of 1984, we, uh, we had a, quite a windstorm after the crop got up somewhat and uh, about lost half of our crop. And at that point, I decided that I wasn't going to be throwing all that fertilizer and, and uh, herbicides 
out there uh, and not and, and and not getting a crop. So in 1985, we purchased Haybuster uh, drills. We started no-tilling on the on the lighter land. Try to move this along a little faster. By 1987, we went to the we went to the whole farm no-till, one pass uh, with Haybuster. Then we ended up with what what are called Concord drills. Uh, and we have used those through up until, until the, just this past year. We were still using them. We, uh, they, they are purchasing a, a horse, Anderson. Uh, it's a, more or less a, a big, heavy uh, one-pass drill from South Dakota. Now, some of you may have heard that. But uh, in, in our one-pass, no-till, uh, direct seeding, whatever you want to call it, experiences, about 1993, the the climate started changing in North Dakota. We started getting wetter. Uh, the biggest indication of that is if you've ever heard of Devil's Lake, it's a, a closed basin in in eastern, central eastern North Dakota. It, it's part of the Hudson Bay watershed, but it it, uh, it, it needs it doesn't have an outlet. Uh, it has increased in vertical height by about 31 or 32 feet since 1993. It's taken up about 200,000 acres of land, uh, scores of farms. Uh, that, that, that's a vertical rise, and it's finally reached the outlet where it can get into the Cheyenne River, over into uh, the uh, Red River by Fargo, and then out up to Winnipeg, and into the Winni Lake Winnipeg, and then finally the Hudson Bay. But that's just an indication of, of how much rainfall we've been getting on average over the last 20 years. Uh, in 1999, we had our whole annual rainfall uh, in May when we're supposed to be seeding. <laughs> and we didn't get a crop in. Our whole region up there didn't get a crop in. Uh, that precipitated me, ended up ending up in Washington trying to lobby for help for agribusinesses. And in the, in the process of that, I found out, uh, well, I, I was acquainted with the members of Congress, and one of the senators uh, was losing their interim ag person, and I didn't have a crop to harvest, and uh, I didn't have livestock, so I said I could, you know, could come and help you. I'm being facetious, but he ended up down in Washington being his ag person for that winter and ended up at, in his office for three years. My son hired him to take over my farm. He's doing a good job, and I'm still in Washington. I worked for the senator for three years, and then I, I got a job with Gordley Associates, and that included the U.S. Canola Association, and that's why I'm here. Uh, they have been farming under wet conditions. They have been farming under uh, the, the younger guys, my son and my nephews. They, they never farmed conventionally. They've only farmed direct seeding, uh, one-pass seeding, uh, and so, and then now we're doing this under quite wet conditions on, on average. Uh, in, you know, off and on, we've had some prevented plant in, in, the, in the last decade. In 2011, an extremely wet year again, uh, Heath Sanders had come up to, uh, to uh, see how things were seeded in North Dakota for canola since he was working with canola in the Great Plains. And we met in, in, uh, in uh, Minneapolis and we flew in and it. It's kind of a wet spring. It was raining all the time, and it was cloudy. And we flew down, coming landing into Minot, North Dakota. And I, I, I was sitting a uh, row or two back from him, and he was looking out the window. And then, it, you know, it looked like we got below the clouds, and it didn't look like there was any ground left. It was all water. <laughs> He's just like this. And I said, I said it looks a lot worse from there. <laughs> but uh, it was a it was a challenging year. That was about May fifteenth, and we just got started seeding at that point in time. Uh, ultimately, we only ended up with about half the crop in. Uh, we had somewhat normal year in twenty twelve and had a really good crop. And uh, then come twenty thirteen, we had it snowed about the first of October, and we still had snow on the ground on May first, and it was a lot of snow. And then we had, uh, this past year, we had several rainfalls. We finally got seeding about May 12th, but after a couple of days, we had two, three inches of rain. We got seeding again, and we had another rain. Well, uh, they asked, I said, well, I better come home at the end of the month, uh, Memorial Day week, and try to help a little bit. So uh, after Memorial Day, I, 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 I fly back, and as, as I get there, they're out in the field trying to get going again. And... Uh, 
we you know quit for the night because we were having some troubles. Well, the next morning we had two inches of rain again. And that was uh, you know May 30, about May 30th, 31st. Well, the Megal, uh, what we ended up doing, you know, they only had about 40 percent of the crop seeded again, something to that effect. And uh, they were starting to panic. They did not want to take care of that much ground without being seeded again. So we uh, were listening to one of the neighbors who also has an aerial service for spraying. They got a couple of big ag, ag cat planes, and they were messing around with uh, uh, broadcasting canola seed. They had taken one of the sprayers off and put a spreader on it and used the spray tank for the seed, and they would kind of figured out how they could get four or five pounds of seed on. They were, they were flying... Uh, high enough so that they would, they would have the seed going out 50 feet, but they were actually flying, uh, or it was going out 100 feet, but they were covering it with just 50 feet. So they were getting a nice uniform spread. Took a little bit of work, but uh, they did some of that, uh, and they were doing it on their own for a couple of neighbors, and the more uh, the boys started thinking about it, they said, well, it would be just as well to be you know, we, we, we put that on, at least we'll have something growing out there and we can spray around up or Liberty Link, depending on what the variety was, and at least something's growing on the ground. Uh, they, uh, they ended up June morning of June 1st, it was a Sunday, they seeded 1,000 acres that morning with a couple of planes, and then uh, we took a coulter similar to what you, uh, that great planes implement out back, and a couple of heavy harrows, and, and that that day we managed to go out and what we could drive on more or less incorporate the seed lightly as much as possible. Uh, that that's it seemed to work out okay, but you know that's that's quite a you know that's expensive seed. You had to pay for the airplane. They were actually playing Roundup ahead of where they were putting the the, the Liberty Link on because they wanted to to get get some of it you know, get some of the weeds out. This was the 1st of June, after all. But uh, a week later, uh, when they were, you know, the, the last couple of thousand, 2,500 acres, they were going to seed the sunflowers uh, because you can seed those later, but the, the weather was not cooperating, so they turned around a week later after I would went back to D.C., and they did another 300 acres. Uh, it turned out really well. It was the best canola we've ever had. It averaged from 2,200 to 3,000 pounds. Uh, one of the newer fields that they were seeding, uh, or that they, they were farming, uh, they had trouble harvesting it because they couldn't tell where the rock piles were when they were combining. They were straight cutting it. All of a sudden, they'd have to stop because they were on top of a rock pile. That's how well the canola grew there. Of course, we had a perfect growing season. Uh, what, what we, obviously, they wish they'd have seeded that last 2,000 acres because we froze up wet. We've had rain all through the, the summer. And uh, they're going to have an, an issue this coming spring. Get it, some of that got seeded to winter wheat, but it got seeded to winter wheat late. But uh, what, what I think they're going to be doing on, on that farm in that part of the country, if, if this is how we're gonna be, what we're going to be dealing with, is that uh, the other thing I should mention is that we're in an odd part of the country where we are growing about every crop you can imagine except cotton, rice, peanuts, and sorghum. We can grow all other program crops. Uh, in 2012, we had, we had oats, we had corn, we had soybeans, we had sunflowers, we had canola, I'm missing one here, malting barley, spring wheat with seven crops. And so, uh, and, and we, there's dry peas and Lentils being grown in our area. There's dry beans growing in our area. Flax is grown in our area. So uh, winter wheat is growing, grown in our area. So it's an embarrassment of choices. And a little bit later when I'm talking in the other room, you're going to see, well, why, why isn't North Dakota growing more canola? Well, it's because we can grow all these other crops as well. And so what one of the problems is it, you have to have the crop needs its turn in the, in, the, in the cedar. So on our farm, we're probably going to get more canola acres grown if it's wet, simply because that day or two that you can't go out and pull that heavy piece of equipment across the field, I think we're going to have one of our air, older air systems set up on our coulter, 
and we'll take the quad track and we'll pull that across the field and we're going to broadcast canola and seed that when we're not able to seed anything else. They may even just have the neighbor fly it on again because if it worked that well. Uh, there's no dry dirt. Uh, the biggest problem, you know, for canola is you got to seed it shallow and and you need need soil to moisture contact. Well, uh, this this really worked out well. It's not not an approved practice as far as you know. Uh, like the extension people says, well, we couldn't recommend anybody would do that, but uh, I, I guess we'll do it again, and because uh, we want something growing on that ground rather than weeds or having to keep it. You know, uh, it isn't that like when I was a kid when we were fallowing part of the land. Uh, our our, our uh, annual rainfall is supposed to be in that 16, 17 inch range, uh, and that includes snowfall. Mine at North Dakota had hit 30 inches by, by uh, October this past year. And when you have 30 inches of moisture in a year and you're froze up five months out of the year, you're in trouble. You've got to have something growing on that ground. And I've probably said enough, so <laughs> any questions? That's why I got asked to come. We, we had airborne canola. All right. Um, Karen came in later and told me that uh, we could set up for, uh, you know, have a round table discussion and have group questions, but you've all been asking questions if we've been going along. So is there any other, have you thought of something else that you would like to ask some of the previous guys? Um, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we, we kept on having rain, and that's why that worked. What was interesting, you know, we had a problem of getting fertilizer on it. I, I believe, uh, I wasn't home, but I, I know they, they actually, they've got, you know, high wheel sprayer, uh, and they, they put liquid, fertil liquid nitrogen on to, to do that. Uh, interestingly enough, the field they thought was going to be the worst because they couldn't get to most of it uh, ended up running 3,000 pounds. The, the probably the, what was the best stand actually got to be too thick because all of it came and that was it you know they, we were seeding five pounds an acre so I mean I don't know if you want to go less than that you know it's expensive seed but uh, we've always seemed to have trouble getting a stand with canola because you know between the flea beetles and and you know crusting or you know you get it seeded too deep or, or whatever uh, but this didn't seem to be a problem, and like I say, it could have been beginner's luck and just perfect conditions. But uh, it, it was it was it was very interesting, and it, it was good that you know their prevented plant was going to be, uh, I think about I want to say two ten two hundred and twenty dollars an acre that, that that they would have received. But they you know they grossed over five hundred dollars an acre by getting it planted, so it was much better off, and it grew a crop. And it's you know not saturated. All right. Any other questions for Alan or Randy or Don? I'd like to know how each one of them stores the canola at eight percent moisture and how well that works. Okay. The question for each of you guys is uh, storage. Um, do you store it at eight percent or? I think that uh, Don talked about that a little bit in his, but Randy, would you like to? Well, we, we did two different things this last harvest. We delivered straight to Pacific Coast Canola at Warden, and uh, they would actually take it at a higher percentage on the moisture, about 2% higher. They'd take it at 10. It was going to be crushed right away, so there wasn't an issue there. And then the other thing that we had done is we had some older grain bins that we picked up, moved off of their foundations, poured new foundations with aeration in them, and we, so we were all set up with uh, new aeration systems. And as soon as we put the first load in, we turned the fan on, and we probably didn't turn it off for two months. And then we hauled that canola out about uh, a month ago, and it was 6% moisture when we delivered it to Pacific Coast Canola. And what was it in the Yeah, probably eight, eight when we put it in. And some of it, 
some of it I know is higher because I talked about the frustration of cutting that clear field canola and in fact there was a 500 bushel truckload that we put in a bin all by itself and figured I was going to be in there with a scoop shovel every other day turning it over but I did that one time and it it dried out and it was acceptable and and uh, good quality. Do you want to talk about that? Directed to the Pacific Coast. Do you know what the moisture rating was on that or at the time? Okay. Good air is key. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a small seed. Right. Uh, we also have the advantage it's a little colder in North Dakota sometimes. You know, we didn't get above 15 below for a while, uh, 35 below. If you have the fans on, you can get it pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, but good air. And, you know, we... They, uh, the varieties, if it was a Liberty Link, they, they uh, sprayed it with canola, or excuse me, canola, with Roundup. And if it was Roundup ready, they sprayed it with uh, Diquat, or... Paraquat. Di, uh, well, Diquat is, I think, is the one that's labeled. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it, it was dry when they harvested it. According to my thing, we got about seven, eight more minutes if we want. So, any other questions? Any other comments from the gallery? Or? All right. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Alan and Randy and Don and Dale and especially uh, Pendleton Grain Growers for sponsoring this event. So thanks for showing up, everybody. <laughs>